and welcome to tonight's Bible study. We have worked our way to Proverbs 21, and let's go ahead and read it, and then we're going to have a discussion. Scripture reads, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. All a man's way seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. The plans of the diligent leads to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. A fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly snare. The violence of the wicked will drag them away, for they refuse to do what is right. The way of the guilty is devious, but the conduct of the upright is of the innocent is upright. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. The wicked man craves evil, his neighbor gets no mercy from him. When a mocker is punished, the simple gain wisdom. When a wise man is instructed, he gets knowledge. The righteous one takes note of the house of the wicked and brings the wicked to ruin. If a man shut his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. A gift given in secret smooths anger, and a bribe concealing the cloak pacifies great wrath. When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. A man who strays from the path of understanding comes to rest in the company of the dead. He who loves pleasure will become poor. Whosoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. The wicked becomes a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. In the house of the wise are stones of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. He who pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. A wise man attacks the city of the mighty and pulls down the stronghold in which they trust. He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. The proud and arrogant man, mocker is his name. He behaves with overweeping pride. The sluggard craves, craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous gives without sparing. The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable. How much more so? when brought with ill and evil intent. A false witness will perish, and whosoever listens to him will be destroyed forever. A wicked man puts up a bold front, but an upright man gives thoughts to his way. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. As we looked at this Proverbs, I want to get a couple things out of the way. Um, two, two ideas crept up again um, that we need to just get out the way right away. Um, the first one is verse 9, better to live in the corner of a house than to share a, uh, sorry, better to live in the corner of a roof then share a house with a quarrelsome wife. And then it's repeated again uh, in verse 19. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. I don't know um, the Bible have a man-centric view, uh, male-dominated view, especially in the Old Testament. And here they are saying it is better to live on the roof or to live in the desert and to live with a quarrelsome or ill-tempered wife. But in reality, 
we know that it doesn't matter if it's male or female. Um, there are some very ill-tempered men um, and there are some very ill-tempered women. And there are very quarrelsome, argumentative men and there are quarrelsome, argumentative women. And so I, I would like to say it's better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a quarrelsome spouse. Doesn't matter if it's man or woman. Um, whoever is the person, be it male or female, that is ill-tempered, uh, quarrelsome, always looking for an argument, always have to win the argument. It is better to live alone or apart from that person is what this verse is saying. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrel. Because let's be realistic, we spend um, most of our time with our spouses, and I know this to be true. Um, before, when Rosalie and I were first married, obviously, uh, we, especially today in modern society, we have a lot of two-income families, and husband goes to work, and wife goes to work, and depending on the type of work you're involved with, um, for the first few years of your marriage, you don't see each other, but... Uh, as I get older and I'm spending more and more time with Rosalie, I have to say it is a far better thing that uh, I made a great choice early in my marriage because a quarrelsome spouse, male or female, doesn't matter, uh, does affect marriage. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, several things affects marriage and one of them is quarrelsome and the Bible makes it quite clear, better to live in a desert or better to live on the roof um, than to have a spouse that uh, is always argumentative and such. So we got that part out of the way. The second part is um, this idea. It starts with the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. And this is the idea that we want to talk about today. And it's not just necessarily a king. Um, the, the Bible used the word king, being that, that a person who is important. But here's the thing. Every one of our hearts, every one of our ways is indeed in the hands of the Lord. All of our life, our very life itself is in the hands of the Lord. And it is the Lord who directs it like a water course or a river. Um, God is the one that determines all those things. And the Bible makes it quite clear. A person's Life is in the hands of God, and it is God who directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. And that idea is followed up with this. Verse 2, it says, All a man weighs seems right to him, but the Lord weighs his heart. And that idea is that as human beings, yes, we have freedom of choice, and we choose what we do. And for most people, they do what they do because they it seems right to them and just. As a matter of fact, as I dealt with um, inmates, people who were convicted of crime, um, one of the thing is whatever they did, they always saw as as if though it was right. They were they did what was right in their eyes. But ultimately, we see it is God who weighs a person's heart. God is ultimately in charge of all lives. And so that idea is carried here. A person's heart is in the hands of the Lord, and it is God who directs it. We might think what we do is right, but ultimately it is God who weighs our lives and determine and finally judge us. So verse 3 said, To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And during this time, um, the, the whole way to receive forgiveness was for you to take a sacrifice to the priest, and the priest would sacrifice it, and you receive forgiveness. And the Bible, even back then, is teaching this idea that it is more, it is better to do what is right. It is superior. As Christians, I know that God forgives us if we go to God and repent of our sin, but the Bible is clearly teaching we should do what is right and just in the first place because that is more acceptable to God than the sacrifice. In other words, yes, God will forgive us, and but that does not mean that God is going to uh, be proud of us for living our lives of sin and then turning around and, and confessing. And I think that's what we I, I would call cheap gospel. And there are some people who go, 
oh, I could do whatever I want. I could go out drinking, carousing, do whatever. And then I could go and ask for forgiveness and uh, God will forgive. But here's the thing. Uh, with intent, the intent is very important because as we read on, it says uh, in the Bible over and over again that what we do with intent is important. Verse 27, I want for us to, to jump to that verse. The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable. How much more so when brought with evil intent. And I want to hook up that verse with the ver verse 3. It says, to do what is right and just is more accepted to the Lord than sacrifice. Um, God back then, over and over again, and we see it in Isaiah, the, in the um, prophet Isaiah pointed out to the people of Israel who was giving sacrifice and doing all those things on the surface seems as good people that to do what is right and just is more important to God than sacrifice. And uh, again, that verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is detestable. And God, that's what God finally told the people of Israel because they were doing wrong and they were doing things that were evil, that they could not come to God after they did evil. And then, you know, and, and that's the idea that I want for us to understand is, Yes, God will forgive us of our sin, but if we have this idea of God like a genie or a sugar daddy or however you want to put it, you know, God is this heavenly father and we can live our lives as, as we want, doing whatever wrong we want, and then go to God and ask for forgiveness, but we go back out and do the same sin again and then run to God and ask for forgiveness, that it's not like an insurance policy here. Um, what we need to do is God wants us to live our right lives as Christian, doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason. We should do what is right and just all the time. And when we do sin, that's when we can turn to God and, and repent of it and ask for forgiveness. Because here's the thing, God judge our intent. And that is the idea that we see where it says the king's heart a person's heart, life is in the hands of the Lord and he directs it. And all of our ways, verse 2, may seem right to us, but it is the Lord who weighs the heart. God judges us based on our intent. Um, you know, if we intend to do good, uh, and here's the thing I want for us to understand. We need to first always do good, but we also need to intend to do good. If we do slip and do wrong, we can ask for forgiveness. But if we intend to do wrong and we go out and do wrong and then we try to cover it up and ask for God forgiveness or ask other people's forgiveness, that's not what it's what it what is called living a good Christian life. As Christians, we are supposed to always do the right thing in the right way, but most importantly for the right reason, our intent should be for the right reason. And so that is what the Bible is teaching. Picking up on the a reverse of that idea, verse 4 says, The haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. And so if, all, if we have in our hearts and in our minds, uh, you know, and, and the scripture used the word, idea of a haughty eyes and a proud heart, this is what is the lamp. People can see what our intent is, and they are sin. And so... As Christians, we are supposed to try to live Christ-like life where we don't sin. And so that's the thing that we need to do. We should live our lives and plan to live our lives as Christian, doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason, and lastly, at the right time. And so verse 5 says, The plans of the diligent leads to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. And so what we're seeing is uh, Solomon, again, the wisest man, pointing out that you know, the way we live our lives are important. The, the way and the, our attention of doing the right thing in the right way is important. And so, when it comes to anything in our lives, and and Solomon talks about fortune in verse five, verse six. Sorry, a fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a deadly sneer. And so, if a person goes out and makes a lot of money, 
but they do it by lying and cheating and deceiving other people. The Bible makes it quite clear that that fortune, that income, whatever they make, is fleeting. And not only is it fleeting, it's a deadly snare. And that's one of the things that I saw over and over again. And I heard from inmates that said, Chaplain, I made all this money, hundreds of thousands. And it was very fleeting. It was like w trying to hold water in my hand. It was very fleeting. And not only was it fleeting, it was a deadly snare that landed me here in prison. And the scripture wants for us to understand that a fortune or living our lives, lying, cheating, deceiving, and gaining by doing deceptive thing is fleeting and in, in the long term is a deadly sneer. And that's why I keep on saying the Christian life is the best life, one that we should always be doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason. And we should not be lying and cheating and deceiving. We should always be telling the truth and doing what is right. Solomon continues with this idea on the wicked side. It says the violence of the wicked will drag them away for they refuse to do what is right. Verse 7, for they refuse to do what is right. It goes on, the way of the guilty is devious, but the conduct of the innocent is upright. And so we see here in the Bible, there's a choice that we have to make. And as Christians, this choice should always be for us to do what is right and upright, not what is devious and lying and cheating. Verse 10 goes on with the idea, the wicked man craves evil. His neighbor gets no mercy from him. When a mocker is punished, the simple gain wisdom. When a wise man is instructed, he gets knowledge. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves uh, uh, as we learn and keep on learning, especially from the Bible and from life and from our experience, do we get wiser in, in experience or do we just keep repeating the same problems over and over? Because verse 11 says, when a mocker is punished, the simple gaze wins them. If we are simple and we see that somebody is getting punished all the time for their doing wrong, hopefully we gain wisdom. But really, we should gain knowledge and understanding. Verse 12 continues with the idea, the righteous one takes note of the house of the wicked and brings the wicked to ruin. And I, I want for us to understand we need to understand both good and evil. And when we see evil, we need to take note of it. And let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, and I'm going to use money as an example. Uh, we, we should really teach our kids, our grandkids, to take note of good and evil. We need to study both good and evil. And, and here's the reason why. Oh, richness and poverty. We need to study both. It's not an either or because uh, I, I heard the story of, of um, one of my mentors, um, Jim Rome, um, and he was explaining to his kids how to save money and invest. And, uh, and, and he, he said the best way to teach them was he took them to the, the wrong side of the track, the, 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 the places where the poor people live. Um, and he said, do you want to live there? And they go, of course not. We don't want to live there. And he said, well, if you keep doing what you're doing, spending all your money, this is where you're going to end up poor. But the same idea is true also for we need to uh, go down to those places and show our kids. If you do wrong things, you will end up in jail and in prison and you will end up with all these problems. And so we need to, sh to demonstrate to our kids not only the good, but the result of evil. Uh, um, in other words, it's not just a push and it's also a pull. We should pull them towards good and push them away from evil. And, and so the idea of the righteous man takes note of the house of the wicked. We should take note and see what the wicked people are doing and then don't do that. That's what that is saying. The next verse then speaks to us as Christians that we should always be aware that we are indeed blessed and we should help others. Verse 13 says, If a person shuts his or her ear to the cry of the poor, he or she too will cry out and not be answered. And here's the thing. 
when we go to God and we ask God for His help, God will only help us if we help others. Uh, or put it in, uh, in Jesus' term, uh, where, or, or in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And the idea is, uh, uh, you know, we reap what we sow. Uh, the idea of karma, uh, whatever we sow is what we reap. Whatever we put out comes back to us. And if we put out uh, anger and hate, anger and hate comes back to us. If we put out um, where we don't care about the needs of others, then when we go to God and God will say, you know, why didn't you help? Isn't that what Jesus said? Uh, you know, uh, well, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a cup of water. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Whatever we do for the least of these as Christians is what God expects of us. And if we don't live up to our Christian responsibility and we go to God and call on Him for help, God is not going to hear those kinds of prayer. And it says, if a man, sh if a man shuts his ear to the cry of the needs of the poor, God, when, he when we turn to God, God won't hear us. And that's what the whole idea was in Isaiah, where um, the Jews would bring sacrifice, but they did, Jesus, uh, the, the, uh, Isaiah pointed out to them, they did not care for, their, for the needy, the orphans, the widows, and that true religion, true religion, is to care for the needy, the orphans, the poor, the naked, etc. And for us as Christians, I want for us to hear that to True religion is how we care for our neighbors, and our neighbors are all people, including the poor. And so, um, how we care for them. We preached the, the last Sunday, uh, love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's the idea that we're talking about here, is don't shut your ears and your eyes and you turn your back on the needs of others. Verse 15 continues with this idea in a positive way. It says, when justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to the evil. A man who strays from the path of understanding will come to rest in the company of the dead. And I have to say that this verse is very true. Um, as Christians, we are on a journey to live Christ-like lives every day. And if we stray from the path, we will end up with problems. And so each and every day, uh, as Christians, we, we remake that commitment to follow Christ and to stay away from evil. And, and that's what it says. A man who strays from the path of understanding come to rest in the company of the dead. Last idea that I want to talk about is, and the verse is repeated twice, uh, verse 17. It says, he who loves pressure will become poor. Whosoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. Skipping to verse 20. In the house of the wise are stored the choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. And it's the same idea it repeated in two different ways. He who loves pleasure will become poor. The foolish person love pleasure and they devour things. They eat up all their stuff. Uh, and the reality is um, God created this universe and gave us an abundance. As a matter of fact, we have more than enough of everything and God provides in abundance. But quite often, and I've seen this, people, some people are born into poverty. I was born into poverty. But here's the thing. We live in America, the land of opportunity. Do we have to stay there? And the answer is no. But the question is, do we love pleasure, wine, and all those things more than we love living the Christian life? Uh, and that's what the, the, the verse is saying. He who loves pleasure will become poor. Because here's the thing. I have seen people who make 50000 who live in nice homes and drive cars and do very well. And I've seen some people who make 50000 and live in poverty. It's not the amount of money the person made that made them rich or poor in that case because they both earn the same amount. What made the person rich or poor is the desires they had. He who loves pleasure will become poor. And he who is foolish and devours all he has becomes poor. But if you make 
the same like everybody else and we're all making the same amount I, I one become rich and one become poor it's it's what determines who become rich and who become poor is what the person does with what they have and it says so it goes on whosoever loves wine and oil which is you know all this fancy nice stuff will never be rich but here's the thing there is a better way and that's what I want to get to as Christians whatever we get paid if we in the house of the wise verse 20 are stores of choice food and oil again taking two people earning the same income and we're using 50,000 making it middle class if they earn 50,000 and they are wise about how they live their lives and they don't go out and waste it um, with you know pleasures and uh, devouring things if they're wise eventually there will be stores of choice food and oil I know I'm teaching in confirmation with the kids uh, for example this idea to budget and to save so that um, you can uh, have uh, or as Dave Ramsey says you should live like nobody else so that you can live like like nobody else and the idea here is that it's not the amount of money we get it's how we spend it and unfortunately I've seen too many people who uh, if they make a fifty thousand they spend fifty two thousand a year if they make a hundred thousand they spend a hundred and ten thousand a year uh, and it's because of credits and uh, easy money and they want everything they want home and car and everything else like their parents have and you know what we need to understand is what makes the difference in accumulating anything be it money or life is by being wise about it I think about it in, in gaining knowledge I did not one day just popped out of Zeus's head like Athena nor any of us happen to be that way but we become rich or poor by daily incrementally doing things or habits determine those things and so Solomon is saying be wise about it and you your house will grow with stores of choice food and oil in other choice things the, the riches of this world and so for me as a Christian living a upright diligent life and using what God has given me with wisdom and investing it in wisdom God then turns around and bless you even more but if you take what God has given you and you squander it and and the whole idea here is and I want to get to it is we need to be good stewards of what God have provided because God has provided as I said as I said abundance we live in America the land of opportunity the land of freedom the land where we can go from rich to poor or from poor to rich or we can stay right we are it's our choice and as Christians we should always choose to do what is right and good and follow God's plan and God will bless that plan and grow it into riches verse 21 says he who pursues righteousness and love finds life prosperity and honor and so the idea here is for us as Christians to pursue two things righteousness and love righteousness and love and pursue means to be actively pursuing it or to be actively doing it and we should pursue righteousness doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason and we should do it with love not bad intent and we will find three things life prosperity and honor a life that God gives us prosperity which is more of the good stuff and honor verse 30 and we will end here there's no wisdom no insight no plan that can succeed against the Lord so ultimately as Christians we are with God and because our plans or wisdom or insight is with the Lord he will bless it but if it's not with the Lord he will not bless it and so we can do our part but make sure 
that first and foremost, we align ourselves with God through Jesus Christ. And that's what I keep saying. The Christian life is the best life, and we should always seek to do God's will first. I will see you all next week as we do um, Proverbs 22.